Hello and welcome to another Hasselbad webinar. Uh, today we're going to be joined by Carl Taylor. If you're a regular follower of Hasselbad, you're probably already aware of Carl and most of his work. Um, today we're going to have a chat with him about his career and I think it will be, um, for those that are familiar with him, um, some insight into him that you maybe don't already know of, some of his early career, so you should all find it very interesting hopefully. So just before we uh, meet Carl, let's uh, just go through a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, so just to remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the Hasselbad YouTube channel within a few hours of the webinar finishing. Uh, so if you want to watch anything back, you can check on there. And also any previous webinars that you may have missed from Hasselblad, they're all on there as well. A quick agenda for today. So we're going to be introducing uh, Carl in a second. We're then going to cover his photojournalism years, some of his early commercial work, taking a look at his educational platform, Carl Taylor Education. We're also going to have a closer look at a shoot that um, Carl did for Hasselblad and the Photokina campaign. We're then going to have a bit more of a look at Carl's sort of modern day, his new studio and then talk through some of his uh, portfolio images. So we estimate this to be about an hour, um, give or take, um, and then hopefully we've got some time at the end for Q&A. So please use the questions and answer panel in the GoToWebinar app, and um, we'll try and answer questions as we go along, or if not, at the end. And then finally, just before we meet Carl, uh, just a reminder of the next webinar. So we're gonna be having a chat with Ali Rahabi, uh, Hasselbad Masters winner, and that's on Monday and it's in association with Golf Photo Plus and Advanced Media. So hopefully you can join us for that. So let's bring Carl in. Hello. How are you? I'm good, thanks Mark, how are you? Yeah, good, thank you. Enjoying the Guernsey sunshine? It's uh, nice and warm and sunny today. Yeah, it's been a good few days the last, uh, last week or so. Okay, and how's things been for you the last few months with the uh, the virus uh, lockdowns and that? Has it affected work too much? And yeah, well, on, on the commercial side, it's been you know completely dead since uh, since March, apart from a couple of jobs. One uh, one job, product job, uh, was able to work remotely and deal with the art directors remotely on webcam and stuff a little bit like this. Uh, and then uh, we've actually been working on uh, another campaign uh, shoot, which I'm afraid I can't say. Well, actually, I can say it's, a, it's actually a, a Visit Guernsey uh, advertising campaign, which is quite interesting or ironic given the circumstances of COVID. But this is for a future campaign for Visit Guernsey's tourism, TV commercials and adverts and everything when we eventually and hopefully get out of this situation. But um, no, fortunately, with the education business, we've been keeping ourselves very busy on that side of things. But yeah, it's been uh, considerably more quiet uh, than it than it has sort of, uh, for a while on the commercial side. OK, so let's crack on and um, look at. Uh, there we go. Um, look at a bit of your background. So um, I've got here that you're primarily an advertising fashion and beauty photographer for commercial clients. That's your primary uh role in your work uh but also um what people may know you for is your educational platform did you want to say a little bit more about that and how you split between the two yeah absolutely well um yeah i mean primarily uh as you say advertising photography less less so fashion beauty some fashion and beauty work but my advertising work is mostly in product photography so um i'm more uh, known for shooting objects uh, than I am people, but I really do enjoy shooting fashion and beauty, and occasionally that comes into my commercial work as well. Um, I quite, I mean, I actually enjoy working with and shooting uh, shooting people, but I also really like the technical challenges of shooting products, uh, and you know the technical challenges that you have to overcome uh, to do that. Uh, our education business is completely separate to my commercial photography business and they're, they're run completely separately. And ordinarily I'd be dedicating about, um, you know, half of my time to each business. Um, yeah. But actually the education business has, has grown and become busier and I probably spend more time now dedicating a bit more time to that side of the business. Okay, and then obviously you're Hasselblad Global Ambassador. Uh, so we work with you quite a bit and I've had the, the pleasure of working with you for a number of years now. Yep. Um, 
And just to, um, I don't know, we've got quite an international um, audience for this talk. So we're just going to highlight exactly where you're based in Guernsey. So it's quite a small island, 65 kilometres squared, sort of in the it's, English Channel. It's so under the letter N. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's how small it is. Now we've got a bit of a close up here. That's better. Um, so how does that work for you in terms of your commercial clients? Is that is it is it sometimes a bit of a barrier or does it does it work for you in other um, ways? It used, it used to be. Um, so essentially when I first started commercial photography, it was very much more in the demographic of the Channel Islands, which is basically what you can see there is Guernsey, and then you have Herm, Sark, but there's also another island called Alderney further north, and then there's Jersey further south. Uh, and they're quite a commercially busy area because um, we have lots of different industries and we've had lots of different industries over the past because the area that we're in, although we're British, we're completely autonomous from the UK. So we have uh, our own government, our own structure of taxation. And that has attracted a lot of businesses to the Channel Islands for those reasons, but not just in finance, some businesses in manufacturing, uh, obviously hospitality and tourism uh, is another factor as well. So when I first started, I was servicing lots of different uh, areas of industry throughout the Channel Islands, Guernsey, Jersey, et cetera. Um, but the other thing that we normally have when we don't have COVID is we have uh, about five flights per day to London. So interestingly, I can get into London from here probably as quick as you guys can get into London if you're outside, you know, central London and getting into the center of London. Yeah. I can probably do it just as quickly. Uh, and as you know, Mark, having, uh, you know, worked with me on, on a few shoots, I can fly in and be there in the morning by nine o'clock, you know, with the yeah. 7 a.m. flight, et cetera. It's only a 35 minute flight from here to uh, Gatwick. So it's not always a barrier. Uh, and as many commercial photographers operate, they use rental studios in the UK or in London. Um, so again, I can simply arrive with my cameras and then rent equipment, lighting, et cetera, rent a studio and conduct a shoot as, as such. Um, the other benefit for me uh, living in Guernsey is that we're also very close to France. And normally we have a ferry car ferry that's about a one and a quarter hour direct ferry to St. Marlo. So that opens up uh, possibilities as well um, for, for working in, in, in Europe too. So uh, no, I, I really like it. It's a lovely place. I'm very much into the ocean, ocean life, scuba diving, fishing, that sort of stuff. So suits me fine. And whilst I like cities and working in cities, for example, like London, I'm I'm not I'm not very um, tuned in with city life. So for me, more than a week in a city, and I want to get out. You know. Yeah, you were born in Guernsey, and that's that's. Why I was I was born in Guernsey, yeah. So um, that's yeah where my my family are from, uh, several generations. It's not like yeah. we're not one of these multi mega rich people that have moved to Guernsey for tax reasons. I, I was actually uh, actually born here, and and um, yeah, my my father's side of the family uh, go yeah. back. Uh, as well here. Yeah, I suppose it's nice for clients to visit as well for, for shoots. It's like a little it bit is, of yeah, a holiday get, destination. For them. I mean, as, aside from working elsewhere in the world, we get clients that are happy to come here for shoots as well. Um, as you know, as you know, and uh, they're, they're they're happy to visit the studio and um, you know, it, connectivity normally is is pretty good and pretty okay for them. And as you know, with the education platform, we bring a lot of guests into the island, um, yeah. you know, especially photographers. Uh, I think like previous guests, like you've had like Jonathan Knowles and Tom Oldham and people like that. Uh, we bring them into the island on the flight from London for our own uh, interviews as well on our platform. Yeah, okay. So let's move on um, lovely and have a look at some images. So this image here, uh, did you want to explain the significance of this? Well, this is a very significant image for me because this is really what kick-started my um, enthusiasm and passion for photography because my very first introduction to photography actually came through uh, a job that I took working in a camera store as a camera salesman in retail. Previously to that, I was very um, involved in art and design um, and graphics and that sort of stuff. So I always had a passion for that side of, you know, 
things and I, I had not had any experience with photography or proper photography at all and then I sort of accidentally fell into this job in a camera store which uh, I took because I'd become made redundant from a, a graphics job that I had and um, I just thought it was going to be a, a, a filler job you know just to, to fill some space but part of the thing with the, with the job was that they encouraged the staff to take a camera and go out and shoot with it in the evenings or at the weekends to teach you more about photography and uh, teach you about the equipment that you were selling. And I remember this really well because I just started and they, uh, the, the guy, his name Don, gave me this Minolta X700 and this was an SLR camera back in the days of film, roll of 36 exposure film loaded into it, manual wind on, and they gave me a 500 millimeter telephoto lens, but it's a special type of telephoto lens it's called a mirror lens, which is a catadioptric lens like uh, like telescopes use. Um, so it gives a very unique uh, effect on the bokeh, on the highlights that you can see in the background there. It's quite a yeah. stubby little lens, but it's got a, a powerful 500 mil. So I went out with this Minolta X700 and 500 mil with this very first roll of film, very first time I'd ever used a, a, a camera and uh, went down to the beach and I shot that image and um, got the film back, developed at the camera store that I worked at. And there was that one particular shot out of the series I took of this horse galloping on the beach. And I just loved that one moment, you know, the horse position, the galloping, the wave crashing behind, the out of focus highlights on the uh, glistening water. And it was really that that captivated me into photography. And I thought, wow, this is just incredible how you can sort of freeze these moments in such detail. Because when you visually, you know, when I was looking at that horse galloping along the beach, it's just a, you know, galloping horse running past. So you don't really get to study those intricate moments. So it, it was, yeah, from there that I kind of became hooked on it. And then I sort of diverted all of my energy away from art in many ways and into photography. And it, it really all stems from that one photo. Okay, so from there, you moved on to some photojournalism. Oh, well, there's a photo, look. <laughs> back in the day, back <laughs> in the day when I was a, a, a young lad, well, a young man. Um, yeah, I'm in my, where I'm old there, I'm probably in my mid-twenties there. And I still had hair, as you can see. Uh, I was a little bit thinner as well. <laughs> and um, that was actually in the jungles of, uh, just off of Sumatra. Uh, there's an island uh, that I did some shooting in called Sibirut where I was photographing the Mentawi tribes and they are full of swamps and mud infested swamps and leeches and mosquitoes and I spent a large part of time working in Southeast Asia shooting uh, and documenting culture and people and um, you know indigenous people uh, there's some more shots there actually the one on the left is a lady from the Mentawi tribe. I shot that inside one of their uh, huts. They had huts on stilts above the mud, and that was just the light coming through one of the openings in the hut. The shot on the right is actually from Papua New Guinea, and that was um, an indigenous tribes boy with his um, bow and arrow. And we were right out in the middle of the jungle there. And as a matter of fact, it took us about three or four weeks on foot to reach that area of um, Papua New Guinea and Irian Jaya right up in the mountain range. Uh, and some of the uh, tribes that we visited were very untouched uh, by humans. You know, this was back in, in the mid nineties and it was really, really a hard expedition, but also fascinating uh, at the same time. So my passion back then was photojournalism and, and, and documenting this stuff because I grew up uh, you know, watching, reading National Geographic magazine and being inspired by people, you know, like Sam Abel and Jodie Cobb and Steve McCurry. This one actually is a little bit earlier. This is um, the Taj Mahal in Agra in India. And this I shot on Kodachrome uh, 25 or Kodachrome 64, which is a slide film. Um, and that was shot on the opposite side of the river from the Taj. The main entrance to the Taj is on the opposite side of the, the building that you see there. This I took a, a little tuk-tuk over the bridge and across, and I thought, right, I'm gonna wait here in this spot for sunrise. 
and I was waiting and waiting. And there was this beautiful haze and the sort of pink light. Then the sun came up and just, you know, just as the sun was coming up, there were these guys approaching from the right hand side of the shop, walking along that uh, spit in the river there. And I thought, oh, my God, this is going to be amazing. These guys are going to walk right under the sunrise. And I just sat there, triggered a shot, triggered a shot and just waited until that crucial moment when when they were right under the ball of the sun, took that shot and was so, so pleased with it. But the amazing thing is like now you'd be seeing the results instantly. Back then when I was doing photojournalism stuff, that was a roll of film, got put in its sealed container into my backpack, wouldn't see the results for maybe two or three months because I'm still on the road, still working, and I'm not going to be back at a uh, location where I can get that sort of film processes. As a matter of fact, it was when I was working in Asia, I used to have to go back to Singapore or to Hong Kong. Those were the only two places where I could um, get get my um, get my film processed. And you're always always worried about heat, and you're always worried about X-rays with airports and everything else. So so mm. much easier with uh, with digital these days. Uh, the, the two guys on the left there, they're uh, Mentawi uh, uh, medicine men or uh, doctors, witch doctors, if you want to call them that. And then the guy on the right there, this is just a you know a lovely moment where one of the um, tribes people was uh, just holding his son sat in um, sat in the, their lodgings. So uh, yeah, really good memories of those times. Okay, and now how was you working here? Like as a freelance and selling the images, or were you commissioned? Or yeah, yeah, no, I was I was freelance. Um, I used to sell my work to Geo uh, magazine. Uh, in-flight airline magazines, American Express magazine, uh, various newspapers, Hong Kong Standard, uh, Sunday Times, um, Sydney Herald, uh, anyone that had, you know, like Sunday supplement um, attachments or various magazines. Back in those days, though, to make yourself more saleable, you used to have to write the article as well. So what you would do is you take lots and lots of notes, Make sure you got all the facts and the details. You do a lot of research before you went to these locations. I wasn't just turning up willy nilly at these locations. I'd already planned, right, that's going to make a good story or that's going to be a good location. This shot here, for example, is um, in the uh, Togian Islands. Uh, it's either the Togian Islands or it's in um, further south east Sulawesi. It's the Badjel Sea Gypsies. They live on stilted huts above the ocean and they basically mm -hmm forage in the ocean for their food and dive down they can hold their breath for five minutes and you know they collect um various seafood and um so yeah i spent some time uh shooting there as well so it's, yeah fascinating times and then something a little bit more commercial yeah i mean this is where some of my work has crossed over in my early years when i switched to commercial photography which came about because really i came to the end of my photojournalism and I thought well you know all I'm doing is living hand to mouth selling a story moving on to the next one and never really making any money and I thought I can't continue to do this going forwards or I was never going to really make a good living out of this so I switched into commercial photography after assisting in um, studios and getting uh, an experience for it but I always kept that sort of um, ability to shoot sort of reportage shots in mind so various commercial projects this was for a book um, you know, I still sort of apply those journalistic techniques, if you like. Okay, and something of a little bit different nature. Yeah, this one, uh, this one's a, a operation in the theatre. That's actually a knee knee replacement that's going on there. So that bit of mound of yellow mess you can see in the background between the surgeon and the nurse is someone's leg bent in the upright position. That's their kneecap opened up and the whole kneecap being taken out. And as a matter of fact, if you look on the far right of the photo, behind the nurse on the right, you can see the metal replacement kneecaps in a tray on the right there. Uh, and then basically, I think they're gonna use use that to put in, in place in the knee, I think, if I remember correctly. Okay, so then moving on to some of your early commercial work. So this is one of your studios here. Um, yeah, it was your second studio, did you say? Or yeah, I think it was my second. I, I call it my first studio because the studio before that was just a little box room. So this was my first sort of proper studio uh, that had you know a bit of space in it to to work. Uh, you can see there, you know, back in the day, still obviously on film. 
I've got um, a Sinar, I think that's a P2 Sinar 5x4 camera. Um, I've got some Mamiya's on the floor there and some Canons T90 and a Canon F1. And I also used to have uh, Mamiya RZ67. And, and back then, I think you can see the Elincrom 101 packs on the floor as well. Uh, so at that time, uh, I was now operating in a studio environment, which was a big change from working with natural light in a journalistic uh, uh, environment previously. Okay, so how did you find yourself going the studio path? Um, like, did you miss the photojournalism or? Yeah, I missed it, but I didn't miss the, the, the money side because the money was never great on that. Um, and, you know, the commercial photography allowed me to start earning a, a proper living from photography. And I kind right. of wandered into commercial photography accidentally by assisting in a commercial studio and then discovering about lighting and, and how you can manipulate light. And then I became fascinated with that. And I thought that and it was from there, I thought, right, I'm gonna move from photojournalism into commercial photography. And then after I had some experience assisting, I then set up my own studio. And that photo there was one of yeah, my early studio days. This is just sort of some general commercial work that sort of, I suppose, crosses over a little bit with sort of headshots, portraiture or journalistic sort of style at the same time, uh, where I'm now introducing studio lighting and combining it with natural lighting as well. Yeah, and then all sorts yeah, of different definitely, yeah. yeah, definitely moving into the more commercial aspect, um, hospitality, tourism, food photography played a big part in my early commercial work. Um, that electronics uh, company uh, used to do quite a lot of work for them they're still a client now although they develop mostly software now not so much on the hardware uh, stuff there okay and some architecture as well yeah architectural photography was another facet um, when you operate as a general commercial photographer which is what I was at the time you basically have to tick all the boxes for any area of commercial photography. So you're trying to take advantage of any commercial work and that might be architectural, might be headshots, portraiture, conceptual, food, tourism, lifestyle, uh, whatever. It's a sort of more broader, general, uh, generalized area you know, of the commercial photography. What I would say is that the thing that differentiates that from uh, social photography is that you're not dealing with the general public you're just dealing business to business so uh, basically what I call a commercial photographer are those that are involved purely in business to business um, workspace basically okay uh, yeah this is another this is another commercial image this one was actually for an advertising campaign um, where we had to create images of various subjects or objects that form the letter O or, or a zero, uh, as it were. Uh, what I've always been careful to do with my commercial work, as most commercial photographers are, is to retain the rights and the licensing to the images. So you'd shoot the commercial work, you would give exclusive rights to the client for a two year period, and then you would retain the rights back to the image again after that period. And this one's been uh, particularly good to me because um, I've used this image and sold this image several times. I think actually about six times now since the original commission on this image um, some 10, 15 years ago, I've sold this image over and over again. It's been a, a cover of a book for a best-selling New York Times top-selling book. Uh, it's been sold uh, multiple, multiple stock times, actually. And these two images here, I think, are sort of quite similar to what you do nowadays, really, I guess. They are, yeah. I mean, those are earlier commercial work, which involves electronic products or um, alcohol, that sort of stuff. Electronic products like that, that's actually a hearing aid, uh, a Philip, shot that Philips hearing aids. And that that is very, very difficult to shoot. It looks a lot simpler than it actually is. But what you're dealing there is something that's only a centimeter and a half tall. And then you're having to deal with things like focus stacking, using very small mirrors, almost like dentist mirrors, to bounce yeah. your light back into key areas on it to get the sort of facets and the shape of the device. So, so very complicated working at that scale. And yes, that's more akin to, to what I'm doing now. Uh, and then, um, yeah, one of the shots there, the one on the right is, is one of the local breweries that was formed. 
Okay, and we've got a question from Dagoberto, and he's asking that sort of what point did you sort of transition to lighting, or I suppose, you know, how did you learn your lighting? Is it just something you sort of analysed and learnt how light works, or did you have any help yeah, in that? It came about from assisting. So when I moved out of photojournalism and then I went into assisting in commercial studios, that's where I got my first experience of professional lighting and seeing what these guys were doing with lighting and figuring out, hold on a minute, they move that there and that does that or they use that modifier. And I, I'm a very keen learner. So I you know, want to absorb and suck it all up, basically. And um, I, I just became fascinated about how you could make something look however you wanted it, whatever mood you wanted, whatever style you want, just by controlling the lighting on it. So I, I became hugely absorbed by that. And then after that, when I set up my own studio, I just continued with my study of lighting. And again, you know, even over a 20 year studio career, um, even now it's just the last 10 years, I would say that I think I've really owned that lighting skill uh, you know, to a finer degree. Um, the images you've got up now, another good client of mine, Specsavers Opticians, or Specsavers Optical Group as they're known globally. So I shoot for them as a brand and they've got stores all over Europe, um, Scandinavia, Australia, um, and the UK and Ireland. So I shoot a lot of their product images. Uh, the one on the left, sorry, was uh, quite a complicated one because we had to super glue all of those uh, we had to super glue all of those glasses on top of each other and the amount of times they fell off that we had to keep doing it over and over again <laughs> yeah i can imagine um and this was yeah. oh, that's another spec saver shoot yeah, yeah we did a couple of campaigns uh so so although i do a lot of product work for them it's not always product there's quite often people with the products whether it's in a fashion sense or whether it's in a uh, comedy sense like this uh, and they did a campaign uh, that was a sort of like shocked about the prices you paid for your glasses when you hear what uh, what they are at Specsavers. So we had this campaign with people and with animals, and then we had to uh, Photoshop the expression on the on the animals. But here, the people again; these people were angry at the prices they'd paid for their glasses. Um, so that campaign was about their anger at paying two prices. And the other campaign was more about the shock of realizing that they paid too much for their glasses elsewhere. So quite often people are introduced into it as well. Yeah, here's one. This one was actually for contact lenses. Uh, and we got the dog to get the open mouth expression by using uh, dog treats uh, to get the dog to bark. And then in post-production, the eyes were raised a little bit, and the mouth was raised to try and give the dog almost the same expression as the uh, as the model or as the dog's owner in the shot. Okay, and then you still did some stuff outside the studio, out and about. Yeah, yeah still doing. I was still doing commercial work um, that was on location, and again applying some of those sort of journalistic elements from my past and thinking about you know combining studio lighting with slower shutter speeds, ambient light, and allowing things to happen like we've got with the sparks from the, the welder, etc. cetera. Um, so it's more of a stage managed shot in terms of, we've got the poor shop on the ramp in the background. Uh, this particular company does um, you know, automotive um, regeneration and, uh, uh, and reconstruction, or whatever you call it. So it's stage managed in, you know, we're gonna put him in there, put that there, but then it's applying those sort of journalistic techniques to that commercial work. Same again here, um, you know, use of slow shutter speed. Um, this was actually a very complicated shot because I've got fill-in flash from a speed light on the camera um, combined with, I think it was about a one eighth or one sixteenth of a second shutter speed to get a little bit of motion blur from the water and the boat. And then this very intense sunset behind, which I had graded down with a um, neutral density graduation filter with a hard grad and bouncing around in another boat trying to shoot uh, and then keeping the boats at the same distance. And, and, and that was the result. So, yeah, very pleased with, uh, with that particular shot. But, yeah, that was back in the days of film as well, I think. 
Okay. Um, yeah, this is uh, commercial stuff, polar instruments. They're electronics, big electronics testing uh, equipment company. And they've got offices, um, Silicon Valley and Singapore, all over the place. They're, they're one of those sort of big electronics companies that's sort of behind the scenes. You don't really hear of them, but their equipment is used to test all of the circuit boards for people like IBM and all the big brands actually use their equipment to test their stuff. So, um, so it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's quite interesting, not something I fully understand, but they say, right, we've got this machine, it costs 500 grand, we need to make it look technical, look like it's in a laboratory. And, you know, so we get a model with a lab coat and we get the equipment set up in the studio and just give it that right feeling that they need for their brochures. OK, and again, I think these images are quite similar to um, shots that I would associate with you nowadays as well. So you've been doing yeah, liquids li quite early on. Yeah, liquid splashes have, have, have obviously formed a lot of my work in uh, recent years because I'm, I, I really enjoy doing them and these are two very early ones the one on the left is quite funny actually because that was used for Jersey milk and uh, we were commissioned to shoot the uh, images for Jersey milk advertising and the images were also going to appear on all the milk packets and as you know Jersey milk's quite uh, renowned and, and quite famous from the Jersey cow uh, and we were given lots of milk to shoot and what we found is that the milk just had the wrong viscosity. We couldn't get it to splash right. We couldn't get it to do what we wanted. And in the end, uh, and this is a secret really, but in the end, we used Dulux uh, emulsion paint and we watered it down. And what actually ended up on the side of the milk packets was a picture of paint splashing in there. Um, and back in that day, I didn't have any high speed flash, but I knew that speed lights gave you know very high speed when used on low powers so i used multiple speed lights um on a mamiya rz67 um to shoot that shot on on film the one on the right uh cream liqueur shot similar techniques with speed lights through scrims to uh to freeze to freeze the liquid splash yeah okay so the thing with the speed lights obviously in your early days you were working on budgets and you were building up your business, yeah. I suppose you make. Well, do I, with I mean, I did, I did have, I did have Elinchrom lighting at the time, but the Elinchrom lighting I was using didn't have the fast flash duration. I think they had flash durations of maybe about seven hundredth of a second, which was not quick enough to freeze that sort of mo motion where you really need about ten thousandth of a second, which a speed light can achieve. But the problem with the speed light is that speed light doesn't have a lot of power coming out of it, so you used to have to use multiple speed lights clustered together to get enough light to do it. Hmm. We've got quite a um, relevant question from Silas actually and when you look back at your earlier work and uh, do you look at it and sort of think oh you know I wish I'd have done that different or why did I do it like that do you look at your old work that way or not? Um, yes some of it you do I think if you if you didn't look back at your work and couldn't spot things that you could improve it means you haven't improved so the, the fact that you can look back at it and say, oh yeah, I would have done that different. That means you've moved on with your work. My work now is very much more refined, very much more polished in terms of the lighting and stylized. Part of that is down to the fact that I've decided to keep learning with lighting. Part of that is down to the fact that with digital and shooting on the Hasselblad and large screen, full screen previews in focus, you can actually really um, analyze and study the results much more carefully than you could you know, with a Polaroid, which is you were shooting a Polaroid back in the days of film, you, you'd have a cassette back for your film or a dark slide with 5.4 and you'd put Polaroid back on first and shoot your Polaroid test shots. But a Polaroid doesn't give you a huge amount of detail, whereas now with digital, you know, you can really fine tune what you're looking at and analyze the lighting. Um, and, you know, yeah, you progress as a photographer. But in saying that, there are still some of my earlier images that, you know, I'm quite proud of. I'm not, a, not afraid to show them. Um, quite happy for you to show them here, uh, no problem at all. Um, here's another image that was um, uh, shot for FC UK glasses. We shot a campaign for them about five days in Tenerife, and then uh, there was a couple of extra shots that we needed, uh, and we ended up having to shoot in the studio. So this was one that was shot in my studio. We built this textured wall, lit it to look like sunlight, 
and then I created that palm leaf shadow with a piece of A4 paper that we cut with a pair of scissors to the shape of a palm leaf and simply dangled it in front of the um, bare bulb light that I was using to simulate sunlight. So again, you know, it's just using creative skills to stimulate uh, a scene and that that's really what lighting and photography is you know you're talking about delivering a message or telling a story and when you acquire the skills with lighting you figure out the solutions to tell the story and then of, uh, of course as a Hasselblad webinar um, it would be only right for us to to bring your first Hasselblad camera into it uh, which we can see in the image there yeah um, yeah so when when did you you obviously decided that you needed I don't know what was the what was the decision process behind sort of moving to a larger format. Well, this was in I bought my first Hasselblad uh, in 2005, uh, and this was obviously before I had a relationship with you guys. Just it, I was reviewing camera systems to buy. Um, I was waiting for for a while to see where digital was going because digital had already arrived on the scene with 35 mil digital cameras, but they were not of the quality suitable for the commercial work I was shooting because what I had to match was I'm delivering clients Mamiya RZ 6 by 7 centimeter medium format film or 5 by 4 inch film. And then eventually the Hasselblad H1 arrived on the scene uh, combined with the Imacon 22 megapixel back. And that's the Imacon 22 mega, megapixel back, which is before Hasselblad and Imacon uh, merged together. Uh, and it was at that point, I think I saw some test files from it and I thought, right, we're now in a position where this 22 megapixel medium format or 645 format camera can deliver something that is close to scanning my six by seven transparencies uh, on a drum scanner. So I thought, right, OK, we, need, we now need to take this seriously. Uh, and obviously, I've been aware of Hasselblad for, for years and the quality of pedigree of the lenses, et cetera. Um, so I finally decided to to buy the camera. I think back then it cost me about twenty three thousand pounds, which obviously is a lot of money today, let alone in 2005. Um, but it, it was a business decision and it wasn't mm. actually a difficult business decision because I was spending somewhere in the region of about twenty thousand pounds a year on E6 film, that's transparency film, E6 chemistry and processing, Polaroids, etc. Plus you have the three day or two or three day delay time of the process and getting getting the stuff back. So you know going to spend 23 grand on a camera um, and then never have to spend any money on film and processing again and have instant results. But it was also driven partly by client demand because clients were starting to take an interest in digital and knowing that it was instant and art directors, the ability to see the image in, in high quality um, was appealing to them. So I actually went to New York to buy my first camera because it was slightly cheaper to buy it in New York at the time and um, went there, did some training on the Flex Color software, which is now Focus. I was already familiar with the Flex Color software because I already owned one of the uh, Flex Color Imacon scanners, which was then acquired by Hasselblad as well. So the software was, you know, very similar to the Focus software that I'm using today. Okay. And then moving on to your uh, uh sorry did we say second or third studio uh oh yeah third i think this the, third, this yeah. is the third studio because my second studio was in the same building as that that's another industrial unit uh somewhere else uh, and that that was in the same building uh but i was on a different uh area of the building and that lease ran out and then I moved into this one and this was a great studio but the problem with it it was on the first floor so with it being on the first floor and with a staircase access, there's only a certain limited, you know, things you could shoot, smaller products, et cetera, or things that you could carry up the stairs. Um, this studio, I think, was about 1,100 square foot, maybe 1,200 square foot, and then had a little a mezzanine level where my office, uh, or, or Fabian as well up there, my assistant at the time. Um, so yeah, it was great, great, great studio and probably would be sufficient for most of the commercial work that I do um, today even, um, but obviously with the expansion of our 
online business and our education and our training, um, we decided to, to, to move on to um, bigger premises. Hmm. And you've upgraded to the H3D at this point, is that right? Yeah, that's a H3. That's a H3 on the on the stand there. Um, I think I went H1, H3, H5, H6, where I am now, H6 100. Okay, so let's take a look at some of your educational side of your work, um, which you've been doing roughly since 2008. Yeah. Uh, so how did you get into this? Well, um, again, um, I'm, I, I always consider myself to be a businessman and, and a, an entrepreneur in many ways, as well as a photographer. and back in 2007 2006 to 7 there was this big rush of interest in digital photography because all of a sudden canon were chucking out the eos digitals nikon etc so you had lots and lots of consumers amateurs buying these cameras and i kept getting asked to do workshops or talks about digital photography uh, and people want information on digital photography because it was becoming a bit of a frenzy you know it's like skateboarding or something that just took off and i started running these workshops and to, to make some extra money and these are like person to, like workshops at my studio and they were packed and i could literally have run a workshop every day every night of the week i was running them as eat in the evenings and then some of the weekends i could have literally done them six days a week and filled them but I just would have obviously been exhausted because I was still doing my commercial work in the day. But then I thought, well, hold on a minute, this is just crazy, you know, how can I expand this out? So I approached uh, a media company that I'd already worked with that we'd um, done some previous media, 3D design and, and TV stuff together. And I said to these guys, because I knew they were real experts with, with the internet and, and the web and uh, media production, I said, look, how, is there a way we can expand this out? Can we expand on photography training, but not have to do it in person? So we grew the idea of uh, starting a new company called Carl Taylor Photography Masterclass and creating education training that wasn't your standard boring sat in a classroom stuff that we were seeing coming out of uh, many other outlets at the time that, that previously it was a lot of people saying, here's a photo I took and here's how I took it. And that was their video. And I said, look, I want to go out. Let's do some shoots and film the shoots and show the results on the back of the camera and show it happening live. And that's what gave birth to filming the DVDs. Can we just go back to the, the previous slide? Yeah. Yes, because sorry. the first DVD we launched was the introduction to photography, which is on the left of those set. And then that was quickly followed by the next three and then a few more, and then that evolved into about 12 DVD titles, which were available in retailers. We were selling them all over the world in stores, in those display stands that you can see there. And our DVDs really grew in, um, in popularity. They were even serialized uh, by magazines in the US where I think the first DVD was on the cover of the magazine and stuff like that. Uh, and then after that, we just started filming shoots like in the next slide, where we'd start yep. to get more adventurous with the shoots. We'd go further afield, we'd get more ambitious, bigger things, more crazy ideas, and you know, creating sort of fascinating photo story documentaries about these shoots and how to do them and how to approach them with all the, the planning work that goes into them and you know, basically creating documentaries on how you do this stuff, but with educational information in there as well. So that it feels more like you are sort of on the shoot if you know what I mean um, yep. yeah this one, crazy one in my studio uh, or one of my older studios some of the paint stuff you see all the studio lined out with uh, plastic uh, plastic wrapping there and then you've you've done a few um, like people watching might have met you at some trade shows and that before obviously you've you've worked with Hasselblad uh, this is the yeah, well, uh, show. Ever, since, um, ever since becoming a Hasselblad ambassador. Um, yeah, we've cooperated with each other over the years and, um, you know, talked at your some of your events and also given live demonstrations at the events, which is I'm, I'm happy to do as well, because it also promotes our education business at the same time. So, you know, it's a, it's a, a mutually or what you call it, sym symbiotic relationship in, in that respect. So, uh, so yeah, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And this particular event, you mentioned earlier your admiration of Steve McCurry and you got to meet Steve at this event. 
Yes, that's right. And that, that was really a really great moment for me because coming from a photojournalism background and, and you know, having followed Steve's work uh, through National Geographic magazine since I was a teenager, uh, Steve, uh, who also was an ambassador for Hasselblad using uh, some of their cameras for his more commercial stuff, uh, he yeah. was at the event and uh, I had the opportunity to uh, to meet the guy. I had a really good chat with him for about 20 minutes talking about uh, the, the H5 camera and it, uh, you know, he's asking me a lot of questions and uh, I had a really, really good chat. And then, yeah, we uh, had this photo opportunity there. There's you, me, Steve and a couple of the uh, uh, previous Hasselblad team as well. So, yeah, yeah. It, was a, it was a great, great day for me, that one. OK, and then you've moved on from DVDs now and you, you offer your training as an online platform. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, with DVDs kind of disappeared. They went out of fashion, um, you know, just they died a death, really. And then people wanted downloads uh, or streaming. Downloads became particularly difficult for us to sell because all of a sudden you're having to justify the price of the product, given there's no packaging, there's no shipping or distribution or anything. But a lot of people didn't realize still the amount of work that has to go into producing and filming them and the costs and the expenses, models, studios, equipment, all the rest of it. Um, and then the feedback we were getting from our clients were, yeah, we love your stuff, but it was, it was just becoming too expensive on the downloads. So we just decided as a business, um, I'd sat down with Tim and John, my business partners on the education side. I said, look, we need a different approach here. Um, I think we need to look at a membership option where we can deliver our training to anyone who wants it at a really affordable price. And we charge um, like £14 per month or $19 per month. And you basically can come in for one month or you can come in for a year for a cheaper price or whatever. Uh, and you can access every bit of training we've ever made in the last 12 years. It's in there on the platform. But we've decided again to step it up and go one thing further. So what we do every month is we have two, sometimes three live shows per month where we do live shoots. We have different guests on as well, top photography guests from around the world that we bring into the studios. So we mix a combination of talk shows, live shooting shows, Q and A's, critique shows for our members um, and, and, and lots of stuff as well as all the existing training. So there's always something new and there's two new courses every month as well for your membership. So we think we provide really good value uh, for what we do, and especially compared to selling DVDs at 50 quid a DVD or 40 quid or whatever it was per DVD. Now you can have the lot and you can stay for as long as you like or as little as you like. And yeah. fortunately, going down that route has worked for us. It was a big gamble because obviously at such a low price and managing a, a team of seven or eight of us and you know big studio facilities and the overheads associated with that you need a lot of members to make that pay but fortunately going to the low price and making it affordable to everyone that that worked out well for us yeah and i think um regular followers of the hasabad webinars would recognize a few people off there with tom oldham and jonathan knowles yeah. tom there's that... Oz Becker yeah. there as well Humble. david Stanbury, jonathan knowles um uh one of the um uh, ben Thomas, um, yeah, the Hasbro master, yeah, Hasbro master, uh, Eric Johansson as well, uh, you know, yeah. very well known name. So yeah, lot, lot, lots of guys, Tom Oldham there as well, lots of Tim Flack, Sean Convoy, uh, yeah. So we get lots of lots of guests. As a matter of fact, we've got um, celebrity photographer Rachel Smith, fashion photographer, on as a guest, and she was due to come just before the whole COVID thing. We had mm -hmm. her flights booked and everything. And then we've had to, to, to bin that off. And unfortunately, I've still not been able to get Rachel here because of the current quarantine restrictions. Um, but we will be returning to bringing guests to the studio again as soon as we're able to. In the meantime, what we've been doing is some online webinars similar to this uh, uh, as well. And we will probably continue that as well, depending on the, you know, the situation with uh, the current circumstances. OK, so if anyone wants to check out that, um, carltaylereducation.com to have a look. Great. So let's move on now to um, the Photokina shoot. Uh, yep. So this was 2014 and basically Hasselblad approached Carl uh, to shoot some images uh, that we would use on our booth um, around a theme. Uh, so this is what we come up with. Or what Carl come up with. <laughs> well, yeah, you guys and you approached me and you said you wanted to 
uh, because it was, I think it was uh, also with the with the Apollo moon landings, you wanted to have a, a slight sort of twang on the sci-fi space related yep. theme. And yep. I remember you guys came and said, look, we're thinking of a sort of sci-fi uh, styled shoot. And I was a little bit worried about it because I, I know that those sort of shoots can always go a little bit too cheesy or could be, you know, if they're misinterpreted, they could go completely wrong and end up like a costume shoot rather than a styled fashion shoot. And you said, would, you, would I be interested in doing the shoot? And I said, yeah, I'll be interested in doing it if you let me have creative control and, and let me choose the team. And, and you guys were, were very uh, commandeering. You said, yeah, absolutely, no problem. So we had uh, Bianca Swan, professional stylist involved, hair, makeup, uh, everything. We shot it in London. Uh, Park Village Studios, I think. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So we, uh, we we put the right team together. We came up with the concepts. I presented the concepts of what we wanted to do. We tested some of the concepts here with the multiple strip lights, which was basically I came up with these ideas of having sort of semi android looking um, models trapped in cages. There's one of the big prints at the photo Kina stand. Is that you, Mark, there down at the bottom? Yeah. And yeah, then, uh, probably not the best. You know, I'm not the tallest of people, but it was still pretty yeah. big. Yeah. yeah, neither am I, but you, you can still see that was a huge, I think somewhere around seven by five meters uh, blow yeah. up print yeah. from that Hasselblad H550 CMOS, I think it was, yeah. Um, yeah. that we shot that on. And then, and then the other side of the stand was also decorated with more of the the images from that campaign but again with fashion photography like that it always comes down to good team collaboration good equipment good lighting good cameras good model we had a great model um karina rock karina white from um uh, next model management um and yeah it just went really really well and everyone got on board everyone really enjoyed it and um was it a two i think it was a two day or three day shoot i can't remember yeah, two days yeah yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, we nailed it. I was re really happy with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was one, another favorite. That's still one of my favorite images to today. And the reason is because a lot of people say, "Well, how, do, how the hell did you Photoshop that force field around the model?" I said, "We didn't Photoshop it." I said, "That is pretty much the raw shot. There it is in action there." Uh, and what I did is I had my assistant Fabian holding one of the fluorescent light tubes. And we did an 11 second exposure while Fabian walked around the model waving the light tube. And if you go back to the previous shot, you'll see that motion of waving the light tube just ended up recording like that. And then I got the model to stand perfectly still in period of time in the dark and then go back to the, fine, the, 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 the behind the scenes shot. And then there's uh, two strip light um, Bron color soft boxes, one either side to emulate the, the strip light lighting. And uh, that was fired at the end of the exposure, at the end of the 11 seconds that then froze the model. And Fabian, who's dressed in black, has switched the, or John switches the light off on the floor. He's, there's John down on the floor. And Fabian steps out the way. And it was all captured in, in one image, um, you know, as one yeah. shot. So very minimal Photoshop, in fact, at all. Okay, so let's have a look a little bit more modern day. Um, so this is your current studio. Yeah, that makes it look a bit bigger than it actually is. Because um, that's like one of those panoramic phone shots, I think. Uh, but yeah, we now operate out of 4,000 square foot studio, which has got um, a sort of kitchen area space and reception lounge area. So we can do food photography preparation. Then we've got a big open studio. We've got a drive-in studio as well now. Yeah, there's the kitchen area over on the right and the reception. Uh, one of the reasons we expanded to the bigger studio was because for video production, because we're filming all of our stuff in-house for our own courses, because we went into doing live online broadcasts, which we currently now do for our membership platform. So we need more space for that. And also because we do uh, occasionally, once a year, we do um, an actual workshop here in the studio where we have... Uh, 14 guests from all over the world come into the studio to do a joint workshop with myself and um, Tim Flack. And, um, you know, it's obviously beneficial to have a bigger space for that and, and, and nicer surroundings. So the larger studio, we basically um, were looking for a new studio for a long time. This place was getting built. Um, it was under development and I saw it. And uh, interestingly, 
it's on an industrial park and all the units have uh, a first floor running all the way through but I got in early and I said to the developers and, and the landlords I said look I'm really interested in this building but I can't have that floor running all the way through so if you can just give us the first floor in a quarter of the building and then leave the rest open we'll take this unit um, and we took the unit we invested a huge amount of money in decking it out all of the the, the cove the infinity cove the the flooring kitchen offices etc uh, to spec it out basically exactly how we needed it for the next you know going forwards for the next 10 15 whatever 20 years yeah i'm not moving studio again that's for sure <laughs> So obviously one of the main advantages of new studios you can drive into it so you've started to do some cars yeah i've always wanted to do car photography i've in, i've assisted on uh, car shoots in the past and they're all they, they're always very technically challenging they're one of the most difficult things to photograph because they're glossy they're multi-shaped they've got different surfaces matte surfaces you know potentially for lights to be on glass everything else and they're very difficult to light because you need huge big lights and huge big panels and i love the challenge of that so i thought right now we've got the studio um i want to get into car photography but it actually took me about five years we've been in this studio for five years now and i still had only recently got around to start and shooting cars in it because we needed to fit an overhead floating ceiling uh to do it and this this was a commercial job i did for a little electric car uh company uh, as well uh, and we're also doing some videos as well video elements to that as well um, but interestingly the big floating ceiling panel that we fitted in for the car photography is actually very useful for general product photography it's a bit of an overkill but instead of lighting through a scrim you can light off of it as well like you do for car photography um, but it can actually be useful for smaller stuff too okay then two wheels as well as four yeah, yeah, this was a recent one that we did for the education platform. Um, really enjoyed this. I don't know anything about cycling, but what I do know is when something looks aesthetically amazing or cool. And um, this is a friend of mine who's well into racing, but I think that bike costs about $10,000 or something. And um, I thought, wow, that thing looks awesome. It looked like something that should be in a museum or a, you know, a, a, an art gallery. So that's how I shot it basically, was to sculpt it with light and make it, you know, put it on this pedestal and make it look super important and light it in such a way. So really enjoyed doing that. And that one actually we just released as a new course on our education platform. So we filmed the whole shoot from start to finish, showed every facet of the lighting build up and how we arrived at that. And, and, and what you see there and what I'm also really proud of with a lot of my work is that that doesn't have much post-production at all there was one clamp holding the bike upright on the front wheel uh, and then there's some lights but all that you see in the lighting on that bike that's one shot um, and we show you exactly how to do it as well on the education platform okay then that's another one yeah i'm a big fan of motorbikes i used to be well into bikes used to have a lot of motorbikes and then uh, when my wife and kids came along that avenue of pleasure got closed down so uh <laughs> <laughs> but I still take uh, I still take uh, a, a lot of joy in actually photographing uh, motorbikes. I've always just found them such cool speed instruments, you know. So uh, and that one's particularly beautiful. It's quite a, a rare one, the uh, KTM RC8. I think it's um, uh, nearly 1200 cc, super fast, um, super sports bike. Uh, yes, yeah, some conceptual conceptual work. I, I'm still a firm believer in that images can can say a lot, and um, you know, images like the the one I did for the marine pollution campaign with the the baby with the needle says something. But even more simplistic images can say something. And and this image, it, it actually um, you know brings awareness in many ways to mental health, in, 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 and 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 it can be done very simply. Just this is an egg sat on the edge of a you know a tall building or a cliff or whatever but given a sort of ominous feel with the lighting and actually again did this one as part of a workshop but it's 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 incredibly uh, i always find it incredible how much an image can say subliminally or you know ambiguously just through a simple visual message um so i like 
doing that from time to time and, and playing with these ideas. And I've got a couple more in the pipeline that I'm working on uh, at the moment as well. So um, yeah, I, I enjoy doing those sort of conceptualized stuff as well. Okay, and then just to mention at this point, you're you're now using the H60 100 megapixel, is that right? Yeah, I use that. I use the H6. D100 for 99% of my work. Um, it's a slower working process, which I like because it reminds me of working on film. It's the way I'm, you know, uh, you know, learnt photography. And the H6100 is very good at the high ISOs. This is a good example. This one we shot obviously on location. It was a blazing storm gale going on. I've got two of my assistants holding para at broncolor para 88s off on the right there there's a huge wind blowing in here and i'm running four second exposures while the model is standing still and then firing the flash to sort of freeze her and freeze the immediate area around her but then as you can see in the ambient natural light in the distance you get that motion from the four seconds of the waves sweeping around but because it's shot this was shot in October in, in very low light twilight conditions. I'm, I'm working at 800 ISO here, um, 800 ISO with a four second exposure so I can maintain F, F11 or F16 to get a decent depth of field and then with the flash. Um, so that, that's the beauty of the H6 100 for me is that great dynamic range, the quality of the lenses. Yes, it's slower and clunkier, but for me, I like to take the time. You know, I don't really rush images after image i sort of plan my images and then shoot them so you know i don't uh, i don't take images i sort of make images is what i always say you know pre-visualize them design them recce the locations scout the locations plan the shot and then execute the plan basically uh, and that's what i find is my sort of formula for success if you like in in the images that i like to produce Okay, so um, just this is our final section of the, the webinar. Uh, just to mention that we are overrunning a little bit, but um, Carl and I are, are able to stay on and, and carry on. So hopefully you can stick with us. But if not, as I say, catch up on the, the YouTube uh, channel afterwards. Uh, so yeah, Carl, so we're just going to look at some of your um, sort of favourite images, um, sort of yep. ones that you've got some stories behind. So this one here. Yeah, this one. This one was uh, a recreation of uh, Philip Hausman, uh, the photographer Philip Hausman, who was a good friend of the artist Salvador Dali. And he did a lot of collaborations and images of Salvador Dali. And one of them, a very famous image, was called Dali Atomicus, uh, which was named after the painting Atomicus, which is actually the painting that you can see there on the easel in the background. And this was always a fascinating picture from me, uh, for, for me. Uh, I can't remember, I think it was around 1938, it might have been photographed, um, you know, back before, um, you know, Photoshop or any of this stuff. So so he had, you know, chairs being held and things hanging on wires that were all retouched out by hand uh, in the final one. And I wanted to recreate this shot or try and recreate it uh, as closely as possible. And the BBC got involved and um, we had the, the, the um, episode documented on the one show. Uh, we've done a couple of things for the one show now on the BBC, uh, and th this was one. We built the set in my studio, got everything in position to the exact replica of the original shot. And if you if you see the original shot or look it up called Dali Atomicus, it's pretty much a crop of what you see in that central area there. But I decided to shoot it a bit wider to make mine, uh, you know, my own picture and show the the setup, knowing that you can sort of zoom in on it. And then you end up with the same shot. The only difference is that in the original Dali Atomicus, they were throwing live cats into the shot, which adds this amazing excitement. But, you know, we can't throw cats these days uh, and they mm. certainly wouldn't allow throwing cats on the BBC. So um, so we I, I went with the idea of putting a toaster in with a couple of my images popping out of the toaster uh, to, to create that same sort of energy. But, yeah, I was really really pleased with uh, with that and if anyone's interested in watching the episode that was on on the BBC it's on my website carltaylor.com on my commercial site in the uh, film and video section okay then uh, this is the image we've been using to advertise today's webinar uh, yep. so what's the, what's the story behind this one 
this one was for a marine uh, anti-marine pollution campaign. Um, I was approached by a marine biologist who wanted to create some images that they could use and put out to various charities and organizations that are involved in um, uh, you know uh, marine uh, ecosystems and, and etc. And I, I was allowed again, given the free reign to come up with the idea. And, uh, and Richard Lord, the marine biologist, said to me, "Look, we've collected all of this stuff that's been collected off the beaches in just you know a few weeks period. This is just gets washed up in storms." And I couldn't believe it. Uh, it was just incredible the amount of plastic and junk and discarded fishing rubbish and stuff. And I thought, well, what if we can create an image of a sort of mound or valley of all this rubbish that would be you know visually appealing? but shocking at the same time and would have a message in it about future generations. So I suggested the idea of putting a baby in the shot, but then make it even more shocking by having the baby holding a hypodermic needle. Um, yeah, there you can see it there. Because two, in, in all of the stuff that they were collecting off the shore, there was also hypodermic needles, which you know is disgusting, but that's what was getting washed up as well. So I said to Richard, look, if we can have the baby holding the hypodermic needle, this is going to be high impact. It's going to get talked about a lot. It's going to raise a lot of awareness. We made it available for all the various charities and organizations to freely use the image. It's, it's, it's still available uh, to any marine charities that want to use the image. So obviously, we couldn't give the hypodermic needle to the baby. But what we did is we sterilized the syringe, and then we just gave the baby the plastic part to hold. And then I just, in post-production, I added the needle in Photoshop. But the amount of hoo-ha that it created when the image was published, it had over a million views, the piece on the BBC News website. And uh, the image went all over the world and it was you know, highly spoken about. And it was great because it was that hypodermic needle in the baby's hand that created the hoo-ha that I wanted it to that then got it talked about and got people going, oh, how could you do that? How, you know, and then multiple times we had to say, watch the behind the scenes video. You can see that we never put the baby in harm. There was no hypodermic needle in there, et cetera, et cetera. But it did exactly what we needed to do. It was the shock factor. And unfortunately, it's the shock factor that's necessary sometimes to get people to pay attention. Uh, yeah. And when it's an environmental campaign image uh, and we're bombarded with so many images, I wanted something that was going to get people's attention. And I'm particularly keen on uh, anti-pollution campaigns to do with the marine environment because I'm, you know, a, a, a scuba diver and fishing, et cetera, myself. So uh, very much, you know, uh, with conscious of that in my in my own mind. So really enjoyed it. And the whole team here put a great work ethic in. We took a week basically creating two different images for the campaign because it was so much work getting all this rubbish positioned so carefully and everything stylized and lit you know so carefully to create the image okay and then this uh catching photo here as well yeah i think that's one you use on my ambassadors page on the house of blood website yeah, um so. that one uses visual science actually i'm not going to say too much about it because i don't want to give too much away because that we cover that in uh, in our in-person workshop but there are areas of that image that will annoy and irritate your brain. Um, probably those viewing, depending on what resolution they're viewing, if they're looking at the model's body, they're going to see something in their eyes that sort of creates a sort of annoyance with the, the, the visual uh, balance and flickering there. And that's all to do with uh, luminosity values and color values competing with each other. Uh, and then what I've done is I've spotlit her face in the classic sort of beauty triangle by using a pico bronze color pico light with the blade set to create the light um and and yeah just again erring on the sort of sci-fi theme that i often have in a lot of my fashion images slightly edgy dynamic sometimes strong dark shadows uh and diagonal lines but something that just you know creates a little bit more visual interest but particular image I call it my Blade Runner image because it's um, it, it's it's got that sort of feeling uh, about that you know that look to it that I wanted to to um, incorporate in the image. Okay, and then back to a product shot here. Yep, product shots, a lot of bottle shots, liquids, getting liquids to look good, beers, ciders, things to glowing liquids to look right, 
Um, that another one very uh, popular one. That one's actually from some years ago. We had a mm. glass bottle cut in half. We put an apple inside each part of the bottle. Then we shot a full bottle in exactly the same position, lit it in a very theatrical way, and then photoshopped the two images together to create that final um, advertising image. Okay, and then this image here is actually shot in your studio? It is, uh, and that actually uses the set from the Salvador Dali shot. Um, what we did is we built this set for the Salvador Dali thing, and we thought, well, it'd be a shame to rip this down without using it for something else. So we repurposed it and added those dado rails on it to make it look like a sort of, you know, country, uh, ho big posh country estate, uh, and then use some particular lighting techniques uh, to create uh, that sh the edgy fashion shot. And then a different, uh, yeah, different, use yeah, different use. Again, with lighting, uh, you can create different moods, different feelings. So we've got a completely different mood and feeling to this shot from the previous one, yet we've got the same model and the same set. But again, it's just mm -hmm. knowing how to control lighting to basically deliver the message that you want to deliver. Okay. And then this one here, which was actually shot for Hasselblad for the launch of the H6D. Um, yeah. So I think yeah. the message behind this was the, the sort of the 16-bit color. You know, it's all about color. I guess this image. It was about the color, but it was also um, introducing the orange. That was when you introduced the orange button on the yes, Hasselblad. Yeah. Uh, so we came up with the idea of introducing orange as the central point of the shot. And again, this uses a, a lot of sort of visual science and color theory stuff here because the um, orange color in there is the exact juxtaposing color the opposite of the blue color in the background so we knew which orange we were going to use in the paint tins so we deliberately found the exact opposite color to that and painted the background in that blue which therefore makes that orange ping out even more lively uh, from the shot and give it even more three-dimensionality and and those people that uh, haven't seen that video it's uh, it's on your channel um, yeah. and you know, you'll see how we created the ski ramps to let the paints of tin go down the ski ramps come off and then collide together very fast flash duration uh, and again you know it's interesting because it, it i enjoy doing that fast liquid stuff work it, it reminds me of the salvador dali or the philip Halsman shot and um you know it's sort of that it, that's where i guess that inspiration comes from how many takes would you normally uh, need for this type of shot Lots. how many would you, yeah with lots and lots. I think we spent at least a week in prep and uh, testing, and then two or three days of actual shooting, you know, over and over, huge mess to clean up. Um, you know, it, 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 was a, it was an incredible amount of work because remember, we were also producing video for it as well. So, mm. so we were not only doing stills, we were doing video of the, of the shoot. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was a, a lot of work, a lot of, a lot of takes. We're using a trigger, though, to trigger the lights at the right moment. So we use a sound trigger. So when the paint tins hit, when the noise they make, that's what trigger the flash and the camera. And then you can set a delay time on the trigger. So if the, the trigger is too early and the paint hasn't come out yet, you basically put in a, a millisecond amount of delay and you can keep extending it, extending it until you get to the right point when the noise and then the trigger might happen 40 milliseconds later and that might be the right the best time when the paint happens but there's a lot of chaos theory in this sort of stuff you know you do it you get it right for one but then it's not right for the next but you just have to say yeah. right this is about the right delay time and you know one in 20 shots is good sort of thing you know yeah and then you had quite a bit of clearing up afterwards i guess oh, yeah. massive amount <laughs> of clearing up <laughs> okay and then uh this image here which is very interesting yeah, um, again, just sort of that sci-fi fashion theme that I like, that sort of edginess, simplicity in my work. Quite, I like things to keep things quite clear and easy to absorb. Two nice juxtaposing colours, the blue eyes of our lovely model Karis there, the red lipstick and the blue eyes combined with the blue uh, headgear thing there, which was actually constructed out of um, plywood uh, and cut to shape. And then just careful lighting, you know, particular spots of lighting um, just to create something, you know, quite sort of dynamic, I think. OK, so that's the last image we're going to take a look at. Uh, so let's uh, move on to some questions, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Um, 
so we've got a question from Maxine and she's saying uh, what advice would you give um, I assume she's talking about herself but apologies if she's not but if um, for a 50 plus year old is it still worth trying to get into photography or is it too late in her I mean I'm 50 plus I'm 51 myself um, obviously mm -hmm. I've been doing it for a long time um, you know people like Tim Tim Flack who's a very successful photographer I don't know if he he doesn't mind me saying his age I think he's 60 now and, and you know he's still at the top of his game producing in, in incredible work and I think he's on his sixth book and um, you know, even even although Tim was a, a, a commercial photographer before he, he involved in the animal photography, probably the last 15 years of his career that he's been the most popular. So yeah. there are a lot of photographers. Um, you know, a lot of photographers actually, I think, sometimes do better in the latter part of their career because they've evolved that experience and and, and knowledge on um, you know lighting, etc. That they they they've sort of reached a point in their career that they understand the process better, certainly for me anyway as well. Um, so I don't think it's too late. I think the problem is that making a name for yourself and getting yourself out there can take a bit of time, but it doesn't take um, forever. So mm -hmm. no, I don't, I don't think it's too late and I don't think I would want to put anyone off. I think at the end of the day, any art director or business it's it, the bottom line is are you going to do something for them that is useful to them and if you are they don't care how old you are you know if you you know if you're able to make their product or their brand or their images look amazing that's all they care about so they don't care whether you're 25 35 45 or 55 they're only they only care about the end result okay and um... Question from Whale, uh, what's been the biggest challenge of your career? Um, it's been multiple, you know, I mean, obviously the adaptation from moving from film to digital was quite a big jump, but in some ways that made life a lot easier. Um, there have been a couple of times in my career where I've nearly given up or decided that, you know, it was too much work or business wasn't good enough. We had the you know the economic dot-com boom and bust um you know that you know I, I lost a lot of work at that period we had the economic crash of 2008 which actually mm. was a blessing in disguise for me because we lost work as did lots of other businesses as businesses are now with covid but because of the downturn in commercial business i upturned the education business because mm. we've been sort of dabbling with the education idea but never really moving it forwards because I was always really busy as a commercial photographer. And then yep. the economic crash happened and all of a sudden got quieter. So it was the perfect opportunity to actually take the education thing and push it up. And now look at our education business. It's a hugely successful um, platform that I thoroughly enjoy, uh, which came about as a silver lining to the 2008 economic crash. Um, so there's always been challenges. I think the, dif the difficulty is in how you manage those challenges and what you do with them. And my process of thinking is always trying to think of, in an entrepreneurial fashion, trying to think, well, what can we do with this? What opportunity can arise from this difficult situation? Um, so, so, so yeah, I think you know, being a photographer is one thing, but being a successful photographer, it's a business. And, and any any photographer, restaurant owner, artist, musician, whatever, if you're more business minded and more astute, then you're obviously more likely to achieve success. So it's a combination of skills, really. Um, and the challenges are, are wide and varied. I, I can't really say what one challenge there's been. There's been there's been many, but it's really how you handle those challenges. Hmm. OK. A uh, question from Stefan. Um, he said, um, what are the benefits of moving from a 35 mil full frame to medium format? And he shoots motorcycles. Um, so what would be the benefits for him with the different format? Or what? Or not even benefits, but what would the differences be? Well, uh, let, let me start with what the disadvantages would be. Um, 
for me, obviously 35 mil, if you need to shoot rapidly, like multiple, like five frames a second, 10 frames a second, that's that's the domain of 35 mil. If you need super fast auto focusing and auto focus tracking, that's the, 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 the benefit of 35 mil. Yeah. The advantages for me, and the reason I shoot medium format, comes down to one thing and one thing alone, and that is image quality. I'm looking for the absolute best tonal range to work with. Uh, the uh, the expanded dynamic range gives you also an, uh, an extra ability in the post-production stage. Uh, the silkiness of the images, the sharpness of the images, the ability to blow the images up, all of those elements. Also the image, the ability to crop in the image. Sometimes I'm sh shooting commercial product shots and you're having to give a sort of wider view on the shot and knowing that the art director might want to crop in on one particular area. Actually, we're doing that on the, the campaign we've been working on recently. We've been shooting everything landscape wider than it needs to be, but the actual campaign ends up in portrait format. So they're going to be cropped into. So that's that's another advantage. But you have to be prepared and accept that, yes, the autofocus isn't going to be as fast as 35 mil. Your camera is not going to shoot as fast. But for me, I don't mind that because I'm, I'm, I'm more about timing. I'm more about setting up the shot and making the shot and then shooting it at the right moment. I'm not about trying to rapidly shoot loads of pictures and choosing one. Um, so for me, the way of working with medium format works better. Um, so, 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 so the advantages really for me are image quality. That's, that's why I stay with medium format is, is image quality. Okay, great, thank you. A uh, question from Ian, uh, with your stock images, do you sell them yourself or do you use an agency or a website provider? Uh, I used to do some stock work, but stopped that now, stopped it some years ago. I think a lot of the bottom has fallen out stock uh, photography market, especially with royalty free images and uh, low price micro stock, as they call it, with $10, $20 images. So all I've got now is my own commercial work on my website. And um, occasionally someone will come to me and say, can I license that image? And um, obviously then I can just do it and license it myself and keep, uh, you know, keep, keep the rights managed myself, not do royalty free versions, because I think even Getty now have gone full royalty free only they don't even do any rights managed images anymore um mm. so yeah i mean some people do are successful in stock photography but i think you've got to really know what you're doing with micro stock photography to create the right sort of images and have a lot of them that are going to sell regularly because if you're selling them at 150 dollars an image and then you're only getting 40 percent because some of them might be the stock agencies now are giving photographers even less of a share. It used to be 50-50. And I think now it's down to 20% in some cases. So it's a harder, harder area to make money. Okay, a uh, question from Joseph. Um, he's asking, do you still shoot film at all for any projects or just for your own? No, no I, um, I, there's, there's nothing wrong with shooting film and I'm perfectly competent and capable of shooting film, but I just have no reason or need to. Film isn't going to deliver me a better quality image than I get out of a H6100, mm -hmm. so I don't see the point. Uh, if there was an advantage image quality wise of say shooting a 5x4 transparency and drum scanning that, then I would, but the H6100 can deliver an image beyond what I could get from a 5x4 tranny, and then um, you know, you don't have any of the hassle of developing, waiting, scanning, and all that stuff. Um, so no, I don't. I don't shoot film. I spent 15 years of my early career shooting film. Um, that was enough. Okay. Uh, question from Joyce. Um, can you briefly just um, let us know what your workflow is in terms of um, image processing and how you get from capture to delivery to the client? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're taking a very quick step backwards. All of my commercial work, 90% of my commercial work comes from an art director or an ad agency or a creative brief. So they give me a drawing or picture and you have to sort of match that or you have a meeting with them and suggest that. And if it's my own brief or my own work, then I pre-visualize it and sketch it and, and know exactly what I want to shoot in advance. And I find the process of sketching and pre-visualization 
helps me think about how I'm going to light it, how I'm going to shoot it, what lens I'm going to use, etc. Then there's the actual shoot, and then during the shoot process, I'm trying to match my own brief or the client's brief. Uh, some things may evolve during the shoot. Then I'm looking at the images in Focus software, which is the Hasselblad software, looking at it very clearly, zooming in, checking everything, highlight values, measuring it um, you know, with the tools, um, looking at the detail, looking at depth of field, considering whether I need focus stacking, if it's a, you know, a detailed watch image or something like that, for example. Uh, and then usually there's an art director there on board uh, looking at the images and assessing them and signing them off. And then the images then go from the raw file. I then tweak contrast, color, highlight, shadow values with uh, the focus software. And then I export the image as a 16-bit TIFF. That mm -hmm. then goes into Photoshop. And then any final retouching of dust or imperfections on the product, etc., or beauty retouching, skin retouching is done in Photoshop. And then the client is delivered an RGB 16-bit TIFF in Adobe RGB 1998 color profile. And then normally, because a lot of my work ends up destined for magazines or in-store posters or print, then a pre-press house converts the RGB file to CMYK. But that's a specialized technique that pre-press houses use depending on what printing device they're going to use. So I only ever deliver an RGB image file to the client and I use Adobe Adobe 98 as the profile because that's most that's more of the industry standard one that prepress houses use for the CMYK conversion. Okay. Now we'll just do a couple more questions before we wind up. A uh, question from Zacchaeus. Um, what do you feel is the future for commercial photography? Are there going to be, um, for example, is video coming into it a lot more? And how do you see the, the industry going? Well, video has been coming into it a lot more for a while now, um, some years since the introduction of the 5D Mark I Canon, when uh, Vincent Lafore did that great little film. Um, you know, that was when Canon and Sony basically went to war because Canon had stepped on Sony's foot basically because Sony very much more involved in the video market. Now you see Sony involved uh, heavily in the camera market as well and, and, and a Hasselblad also bringing video into their cameras and very competent video as well I must say because you know I made the short film for you guys on the Guernsey Scallop Diver where we took the H6 yeah. and also used it underwater and 4K video with raw log style processing using that 3FV format so I could actually grade the video in the focus software. Slow, but you can export it into ProRes uh, 422 or 444, and then you can bring it into Premiere or Final Cut. Absolute cinema grade quality video out of, out of the H6. So the ability to do video is there now for a while, and we use it as well, and we do stuff clients work for video too. Uh, I think we're gonna see more of a move into CGI for a lot of pro product photography work, simply because a lot of car photography has gone into CGI. You know, you still shoot the backplate images, the city or the landscape as photography, and then yep. what they normally do is they shoot all of the images every direction as well, create a hemisphere, and then they map the reflection, that hemisphere into the car, which is a CG model. We're gonna see more of that probably come into cosmetics, photography, uh, alcohol, beverages, things that already have a 3D model in existence for the product. So, so that might be the case, but I think photography is still here for, for, for a good time to come. And there are certain things in photography that you can never really CGI that well yet. That's like fashion photography, you know, mm -hmm. fashion models, clothes, textiles, fabrics, the interaction that you need on a fashion shoot or a liquid organic splash shoot where you need multiple, multiple takes, multiple versions to choose from. And that sort of, you know, those moments that just surprise you. When you do something in CGI, you basically got to do one thing and take hours and hours and hours and hours, you know, to create it. You've only got one option. With photography, you've got multiple options. You know, on a fashion shoot, you can be shooting lots and lots of shots and then you can really fine tune what works. So photography is not going anywhere, but yes, yeah, certainly video as part, I think what's gonna happen for photographers in the future is we're gonna be image creators. 
visual media creators, whatever you want to call it. And I think it will be a combination of a photographer will be there to deliver stills, video, and potentially CGI. And we'll see that convergence of all of the elements and the photographer's skill of lighting. Because don't forget, even with CGI, in a CGI set, you still have to control lighting. And you, you, know, you can build a great 3D model, but if you don't know how to light it, it's gonna come out looking rubbish, just as the same way if you don't know how to light a product shot, it's gonna come out looking rubbish. So it's gonna be the skills of the photographer that he knows from the studio and knows from the camera that will actually help them in the CGI world as well. Okay, and then the final question just to round up. Um, we've had a um, similar question from multiple people really is, you know, what one bit of advice would you give to uh, someone looking to further their photography career? Uh, apart from the obvious of joining your educational platform, of course. But, uh, is I wasn't going to say that. I wasn't going to say that. Um, advice to, uh, yeah, you know. well, I'll tell you what it would be. It would be the advice that I wish I could have given to myself. And that yeah. was no lighting. You have to know lighting stuff well beyond what you think you already know. Because I thought I was some hotshot young photographer, got his own studio, had a bunch of soft boxes, umbrellas, diffusion, and all the rest of it, knew about hard light, knew about soft light, knew what spotlight was and all that. But I knew nothing, nothing. You, th you think you know a bit about lighting just because you know about hard and soft light. Lighting goes way, way deeper. When you actually apply the science of lighting, the physics of lighting, you can take your photography to a whole nother level when you understand lighting because when you understand lighting and creating mood and emotion with lighting because that's what lighting does it, it brings the emotional value to an image because it's uh when we look at an image we we, we sub subconsciously decipher the mood of the image based on the lighting so for example if i said to you horror movie you can already visualize what sort of lighting that might have. It would be edgier, darker, stronger shadows, more contrast, more lighting from underneath because it looks unnatural, things like that. If I said soft, fairy-like fragrance advert, you can already start to visualize the lighting. But it's knowing how to visualize that to the fine degree and then knowing how to modify the light to look exactly like that that's really important to creating great images. Because when you harness that knowledge of lighting, where you can decipher any, you know, I can look at any photograph, especially if it's the raw or, un, you know, unretouched file, I can look at any photograph and I can tell you how it's been lit, even down to how far away the lights are based on the inverse square law. And when you can do that, you have the confidence that you can create and light any photo yourself based on any mood or emotion that you want to convey. So if an art director comes to you and says, right, I want this to have this sort of theme, this sort of feel to the shot or this sort of feel to the lighting, if you in your brain already know how to create that lighting, you have no fear. You just like, yep, no problem. I know what lighting I need. I know which modifiers. I know I need a Fresnel or I need a parabolic light from here and I need Fresnel from here. And I know that my ratio of fill, the density of my shadows needs to be this, boom, boom, boom that deeper level of knowledge of lighting, I wish I'd said to myself 15 years ago, get your head stuck into knowing, knowing more about light because it will advance you so much further. And I'd say my lighting skills have really come into their own in the last 10 years out of an almost 30 year career. Um, but I assumed I already knew enough 15 years ago when actually I knew crap, you know, so, um, so so yeah lighting that is it. It, it you know obviously you combine that with good cameras and, and and lenses and perspectives and all the rest of it but lighting is the thing that that controls the emotional aspect of the image okay that's great i think that's a great way of, of finishing up and carl it's been amazing thank you very much for your you. for your time uh go and enjoy the the sunny evening in guernsey and hopefully when all these restrictions are lifted we can see you again soon yeah, it'd be nice to uh, to catch up again and um, yeah, uh, do something again in the future. But um, yeah, no, thoroughly enjoyed this. Nice for me to be on the other side of the interview yeah. for a change. Because normally I'm interviewing all the other photographers, so uh, a nice change to yeah. be interviewed. So thank you uh, very much for that, and thanks so no everyone problem. for uh, joining no and uh, watching. <laughs> okay, thanks, Carl. Cheers.
So just to finish off quickly, um, just to go through a few other um, slides, you'll get a uh, webinar survey come up. Um, if you could be so uh, kind as to fill that in for us, it really helps to, to know how we're doing and what sort of things you want to see us uh, bring to you in the future. So that'd be much appreciated, thank you. Again, just a quick reminder of uh, the webinar being on the Hasselblad YouTube uh, channel within a few hours of the webinar finishing, so you can watch it back there and also all the previous uh, webinars and lots of other content as well, of course. Uh, the next webinar is on Monday with Ali Rahabi, uh, 21st of September. So hopefully you can join us for that. And of course, anything, uh, any info for Hasselblad, go to hasselblad.com. We've got everything on there from our webinars, events, uh, obviously lots of information on our products, our partner network, lots of inspirational stories, lots on our history and any support that you need as well. So thank you very much. Thanks for watching and uh, we hope to see you again uh, next time. Thank you very much.